This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. On May 15, 1948, the Arabs lost Palestine. That day became known as a Nakba, the catastrophe. On the 60th anniversary of a Nakba, the Israelis received even more support from the United States. Bush gave his seal of approval in his address to the Israeli Knesset when he vowed to support Israel in the face of what he called terrorist groups. While Bush and his host celebrated, the Arab Knesset members boycotted the session and Palestinian youth clashed with the occupation police amidst rallies and commotions. Shuruq Al-Asad reports from Jerusalem. Jerusalem has held on to its dreams for the past 60 years, to return to its owners and to receive guests and loved ones. Jerusalem, isolated by Israel and its landscapes changed, was sure to speak today. In spite of the deployment of the Israeli army in the closures, which tried to stop it from speaking, the city spoke, a general strike took over the city, and a Palestinian rally took place at Damascus Gate. This rally started from Jerusalem and is a confirmation of Jerusalem's Arabic identity. It is also in response to the occupation's actions that have been aimed at judifying and oppressing the city. Meanwhile in Jerusalem, Israel's celebrations were at their height, affirming the occupation of the city and thwarting the Palestinian dream. The U.S. custodian of the peace process said clearly that he was not neutral. He crowned his visit with a speech to the Knesset, in which he squeezed Israel's hand and forewarned Hamas, Hezbollah and Iran. Bush adopted Israel's story, not only politically, but ideologically. Sixty years ago in Tel Aviv, Sixty years ago in Tel Aviv, David Ben-Gurion proclaimed Israel's independence, a homeland for the chosen people. You are 307 million strong because the United States of America stands with you. The Israelis applauded, but the Arab parliamentarians boycotted the session and demonstrated nearby, along with figures from inside the Green Line. George Bush be by addressing the Knesset on this day, George Bush is basically telling the Palestinian people that he undervalues them, their Nakba and their suffering. He is completely biased to Israel, not only politically but ideologically. It seems that 60 years were not enough for the U.S. oppressor, which safeguards the Israeli occupation, to stop at any limit. So we came here to tell him that he is not welcome, and to say that there are peoples being killed while you are celebrating the formation of Israel. Those clashes took place at the Qalandia crossing. They continued for several hours, as if saying, after 60 years of catastrophes, this is Israel's true face, and this is the face of the Palestinian people who are attached to their story and their dream. These black balloons that were released from here went over the military crossing and might be flying over Jerusalem's sky by now. Shuruq Asad, Dubai TV, occupied Jerusalem. Iraq's anti-occupation cleric Muqtada Assad hopes a ceasefire agreement between his group and the Iraqi government will hold. But he calls on Iraqis to drive out the occupying U.S. forces. Sadr's spokesman Salah al Obeidi said a delegation of five members from the movement is in Baghdad, Sadr city to follow up the implementation of the agreement. al Obeidi said cooperation between the Iraqi forces and the movement is satisfactory. The head of the delegation, Sheikh Mohammad Musawi, also said Muqtada Assad wants Iraqis to unite against the U.S. occupation and avoided bloodshed. Last week, the Sadr movement and the government signed a deal to provide more security in Iraq, mainly in Sadr city. U.S. forces have killed over a thousand Iraqis in Sadr city alone within the past month. And finally, protesters across Pakistan have expressed their opposition to the 60-year oil Israeli occupation of Palestine. Press TV's correspondent Nasser Kazmi has more.
from Islamabad. Hundreds of Pakistanis took to the streets across the country to protest 60 years of Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Israel captured the West Bank, Gaza Strip and the East Jerusalem illegally during the 1967 Six-Day War. Murda Murda Israel. While marching in the streets of Pakistani capital Islamabad, the protesters chanted slogans against the illegal occupation of Zionist regime. They called for an immediate end to occupation and a halt to the construction of the separation barrier in the West Bank. We are here to condemn the Israeli, uh, to, to condemn Israel and America, to condemn the day of uh, innovation of Israel, which came into farm on 14, and they, and he, and it was approved by America on the 16th of May, and on the call of our great leader, great Imam Khomeini. Meanwhile, the speakers at the rally called the American military build-up against Iraq a campaign against Islam. Basically, today we are here to stage protests against the ongoing brutalities of America and its illegally established Israel to show our agony and anger against this illegally established Israel. The protesters also denounced the American interference in Pakistan and the American military involvement in Afghanistan. We are conducting this agitation just to raise the, the basic message which was given by our Islamic and revolutionary leader, Imam Khomeini. As you know that he was a person who knows, uh, who has a very right dimension and a very right mentality for the, the right enemies of the Islam. Similar protests were also held in all major cities of Pakistan. The efforts to bring Western and Islamic world together are not likely to produce results unless the burning issues like Israeli occupation on Palestinian territory are resolved. Nasek Azmi, Press TV, Islamabad. The events in Lebanon coincided with very significant and consecutive events in Sudan last week. For the first time in 32 years, an armed opposition group reached the outskirts of Khartoum. The future of the Sudanese government now depends upon the results of the battles with the armed men from the justice and equality movement in Umdurman. Before discussing this topic, let us watch the following report, which presents the unfolding events on the ground. An armed attack was launched in Omdurman near Khartoum by the Justice and Equality Party, the most powerful rebel movement in Darfur. According to the Sudanese army, last week, hundreds of fighters from Darfur headed east towards Khartoum. They were supported by forces from Chad. Last Friday, the Sudanese army reiterated that they had countered an attack by soldiers from Chad at the border area of Kashkash. The attack was intended to facilitate the infiltration of armed members from the Justice and Equality Party into Sudanese territories. On the same day, the Sudanese government declared a high state of alert to counter the attack by the armed men who had managed to reach North Gordogan province. Fierce battles erupted there and continued until Saturday morning. The armed men advanced quickly towards Omdurman in western Sudan, where they clashed with the Sudanese army until Sunday. Soon after that, the Sudanese army announced that it had defeated the rebel forces. This came as the Sudanese government announced that it had cut all of its diplomatic relations with Chad. On Monday, security forces detained Hassan Turabi, the leader of the Sudanese Popular National Congress Party, for 12 hours. On Monday evening, Khalil Ibrahim, the leader of the Justice and Equality Party, threatened Khartoum with more attacks until the government is toppled. On Tuesday, the Justice and Equality Party announced that the Sudanese authorities have arrested the wife of its leader, Zinad al-Yusuf. The party reiterated that it will respond in the near future. 
On Tuesday, the Sudanese army announced that it had killed Jamal Hassan Jalaluddin, the military commander of the Justice and Equality Party, and had arrested more than 300 of its armed members. According to Sudanese sources, armed clashes took place between the army and armed members of the movement in Western Darfur. The government believed that the leader of the movement was in Wadi Hur along the border with Chad. Ishaq Lekhwisne, Al Arabiya. Ishaq Lekhwisne, Al Arabiya. Lebanon's feuding political leaders uh, will meet in Qatar on Friday for crisis talks brokered by the Arab League. It comes after the bloodiest infighting since the civil war that ended in 1990. Those clashes last week killed at least 81 people. Immediately after the Qatar talks were announced on Thursday, roadblocks along the road to Beirut's international airport were removed. Blockades of seaports were also lifted. Fuad Senora's government and the Hezbollah-led opposition are set to discuss forming a new cabinet and a new parliamentary election law, which could finally see the appointment of a president. The country, of course, has been without a head of state since November. That was when Emil Lahoud stepped down. James Bayes, our correspondent, is in Beirut for us. These are crucial negotiations that will be taking place in the Qatari capital. The situation in this country still remains extremely sensitive. Most politicians aren't commenting, but one key pro-government supporter, the MP Walid Jumblat, went out to meet his supporters today. I asked him about the situation. Mr Jumblat, Al Jazeera, what do you think of the prospects for peace now as you head to Doha? We'll go, we'll go to Doha. We have no fear. And we have to see, and we have, uh, in such a delicate situation, all parties are to accept compromise for the sake of the country. The Arab League Secretary General Amr Musa has been here to Beirut many times in recent months to try and end the political deadlock. He told me this time, though, things are different because the facts on the ground have changed. The, what happened in the last few days? The uh, explosion, the uh, military uh, confrontation, the hostilities, the casualties. And we were dead afraid that this would continue and perhaps deteriorate into a full-blown civil war. And that's exactly what prompted the Arab League to meet, to decide, to come urgently and to do everything possible to bring them together, building on what we have achieved already in the last a few months. What would you say the chances of success are at Doha? Well, let us keep our fingers crossed. And uh, the 50 50 would be perhaps a 50 50, but tilting towards an agreement. A blunt assessment there of the chances of success. No one here thinks that the negotiations in Doha will be easy. James Bay's Al Jazeera, Beirut. Let's get the opinion now of Nicholas No. He's the editor in chief of Mideast Wire and he is live in Beirut for us. Mr. No, thank you for your time. You heard in James Bay's report there, Amr Musa has been there many times without success. Is there any reason for us to think that these talks will succeed where others haven't? Well, I'm not personally uh, very optimistic. Uh, Amr Musa has been here, as you said, a number of times, and he's made similar comments about 50 50 chance of succeeding, leading towards succeeding. Really, we've heard this on a number of occasions uh, with no agreement. There are two things right now that are really working towards uh, a dramatic breakthrough. Uh, one is that the anger and the divisions in a lot of different areas have actually deepened as a result of the armed action which the opposition led by Hezbollah took over the last few days. Uh, this is seen most dramatically uh, within the Sunni community, um, but also uh, one can say within the Christian community, which is partially aligned with the opposition and partially aligned with the pro-government forces. The second thing that one has to consider is that the regional situation is nowhere near as positive as it was in 1989 when you had the Ta'if agreement in Saudi Arabia which ostensibly ended the Lebanese civil war. You have now uh, Iran and the U.S. in a locked confrontation certainly of words, a ratcheting up of words. Uh, you see also among the Sunni regimes aligned with the U.S. a real anger at what has happened here in Lebanon.
The Iranian ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, Hamid Rida Asifi, cited the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Mohammad al-Baradi, saying that the Iranian nuclear program is not complicated and that there are no confirmed reports indicating that it is not peaceful. Our reporter, Khalid al-Mashani, met with the Iranian ambassador, Asifi, and asked him about the bilateral relations between the United Arab Emirates and Iran, and how the island's issue has affected these relations. Iran and the United Arab Emirates have coexisted side by side for thousands of years. They share the same religion, civilization, and history. I think that they also share the same future and faith. We are close to our neighbors, and as the late Sheikh Zayed had said, Iran and the United Arab Emirates have always been friends. We in Iran consider the United Arab Emirates a friend. The current bilateral relations have progressed a great deal. The biggest proof is the visit of His Excellency, the Iranian President, to the United Arab Emirates, as well as the visit of Rashid Mohammed bin Rashid, the Vice President of the United Arab Emirates, to Iran. These two visits were successful, and the leaders of the two countries have been exchanging views continuously, and we value these relations. Our cooperation will continue to increase significantly. You have talked about these visits which were carried out at a very senior level. Do you think that they will strengthen the bilateral relations between the two countries which are already friends? These visits enhance bilateral relations and help solve economic and other problems. We know that there have been interventions by some foreign countries and we hope that those countries will not be allowed to interfere in the internal affairs of the region. We think that all the problems can be resolved by exchanging views, solidarity and with consultations with other countries in the region. Mr. Ambassador, calls were made by Arab leaders and from the Gulf and the world to resolve the problem of the United Arab Emirates islands in a peaceful way. Are the Iranians receptive to these calls? We have many common interests with the United Arab Emirates. We can resolve any problem or misunderstanding through good intentions and by exchanging views. The two countries have great capabilities in many areas and they can be developed through cooperation. Does Tehran expect a solution in the coming period for its nuclear program? Pertaining to the peaceful nuclear program, we have submitted new suggestions to the Western countries and the United Nations in an attempt to deal with the challenges. We see other problems in the world, such as the problem of Palestine and the disparity between the poor and the rich and other problems that have not been resolved. We submitted these suggestions which deal with economic, security and political aspects. I would like to add that Iran's peaceful nuclear program is not complicated, but America portrays this issue in a different manner. In Afghanistan, 18 people were killed and 22 others were injured by an explosion in a commercial market in western Ifrah. The province governor, Roh al-Amin, said that the explosion took place near a police station. 18 people were killed, including five policemen. In Pakistan, 18 people were killed by an explosion of two missiles believed to have been launched by a United States aircraft. The missiles were dropped over an area bordering Afghanistan. A Pakistani government official accused the United States forces of killing civilians and targeting government representatives and armed individuals in tribal areas which are trying to end the cycle of violence.
Missiles have become the most common method of communication used by the United States in its war on what it calls terrorism in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Usually, these strikes leave dozens of civilians dead. A U.S. aircraft carrying two missiles targeted a home in Damadullah, a Pakistan village on the border with Afghanistan. The U.S. claimed that the house belonged to one of the Taliban members. The attack killed 18 persons at least, including women and children who were buried under the debris. The house was completely destroyed, along with a nearby mosque, which was not spared from the U.S. missiles either. My brother had invited his school classmates to the house. About five minutes after the night prayer, the Americans raided the house. Eight of the students were killed and several others were injured. Government officials condemned the attack and accused the U.S. forces of killing civilians and targeting government officials, along with armed individuals, in tribal areas. The U.S. did not officially confirm conducting air raids over Pakistan. However, the remains of the rockets provide the proof, regardless of what Washington denies or tries to overlook. Afghanistan was not spared either from the U.S. weapons, which do not falter in carrying out attacks under the guise of pursuing the Taliban. They leave behind scenes that speak louder than words, reflecting the U.S. forces' indiscriminate bombings, which often fall on civilians. It has been reported that 200 civilians were killed in the first four months of this year. Most of the time, they were killed in operations carried out by the United States state forces. In spite of the criticism and the accusations of targeting civilians, the U.S. forces insist on their announced and unannounced targets. They want to end what they refer to as terrorism in these two neighboring countries. Iraqi academics and researchers attended a conference at the School of Political Science in which they evaluated the political changes in the country during the past five years. We leave you with Ali Ramadan. A conference was held at the School of Political Science to evaluate the political developments in Iraq during the past five years. Some of the discussed topics included the nature of American-Iraqi relations, the security agreement, the internal Iraqi conflicts, the political behavior of individuals, and the political system in the country. The college holds annual conferences to evaluate the political developments in Iraq and tries to look at these developments from a scientific point of view. The objective is also to provide solutions to policymakers in Iraq on many issues. So far, the political objectives of the Iraqi government are not clear. This is contradictory to the U.S. policy. The political system in Iraq is still based on the rules of the zero-sum game. Political players win everything or lose everything. The people who attended the conference, both the researchers and audience, talked about the suspicious American-Iraqi security agreement. There are concerns that it is the only alternative that Iraq has to get rid of Charter 7 of the United Nations without being harmed. If the United States would stop protecting Iraq, it will be vulnerable for lawsuits pertaining to war compensations. We are completely aware that the only solution to get Iraq out of Charter 7 of the UN is to sign a security agreement. Political official Mariana Reyes stressed the importance of research. While Reyes believes that Iraq is getting closer to the safety shore, parliament member Omar al-Jabouri did not give an optimistic view about the political reality in Iraq. He said that the source of problems is the recent political thinking in Iraq. One can say that Iraq has become close to the safety shore, but it has not arrived. Political observers, regardless if they are parliament members or not, can't make an optimistic analysis that is contrary to what is happening on the ground. Of course, there are weaknesses in certain aspects, but I believe that the source of problems is the nature of the recent political thinking that is based on sectarianism. This has weakened the unity of Iraqi society.
The chair of the political science department, Amr Hassan Fayyad, confirmed that there is coordination between the Iraqi government and the College of Political Science. Fayyad stressed the need to support the democratic system and the creation of checks and balances which are bound to make political decisions more mature and useful. A Somaria satellite channel, Ali Ramadan. After a week of fighting, the Lebanese government has caved in to Hezbollah's demands. The obvious winner is Hassan Nasrallah. But there are other winners and other losers. Who are they? Answers to this question and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. The warring parties in Lebanon agreed to a deal brokered by Arab diplomats and incoming flights to Beirut's international airport have resumed, ending a week of bloody political crisis. More than 60 people were killed since violence in Lebanon broke out on May 7th, after the government discovered an electronic surveillance system used by Hezbollah to monitor Beirut's international airport and fire the head of the security there. The government has also tried to declare illegal the group's private telephone network. But after a week of posturing, the U.S.-backed government has caved in. The beleaguered government of Fuad Senora rescinded its decisions against Hezbollah. The obvious winner is Hassan Nasrallah and his followers in Lebanon. But there are other winners and losers in the aftermath of these latest Lebanese confrontations. Hours before this latest broker deal, the Saudi Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal had accused Iran of supporting a coup in Lebanon. If Iran is backing or supporting the coup that took place in Lebanon, it will have a negative impact on its relations with all the Arab and Muslim states. He also accused Hezbollah of planning the attack on Beirut and using political issues as an excuse to start the violence. If this wasn't pre-planned, I don't know what is. When asked about Al-Faisal's remarks, the Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said, It's possible that these comments were made out of anger. I do not know how well coordinated his views are with those of Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah. The fact of the matter is, nothing comes out from the mouths of Saudi officials or Saudi media without the full knowledge and approval of the king himself. Since it brokered a peace deal that ended Lebanon's 1975 civil war, Saudi Arabia has invested billions of dollars in the country's reconstruction. This has been done by corporations set up by the late Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, one of the reasons why the kingdom criticized Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah during the Israeli war on Lebanon a couple of years ago. Saudi Arabia, which views itself as the leader of Sunni Islam, has been trying in vain for the past several years to counter Iran's influence in Lebanon. These recent events have highlighted its failure. Iran has won big in Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia was outmaneuvered. Meanwhile, Hezbollah's victory coincided with President Bush's outgoing victory lap, a five-day tour of the Middle East, taking him to Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. The U.S. president praised Israel, talked about peace and democracy, and as usual, Bush made a special mention of Iran and its alleged pursuit of nuclear weapons. For the sake of peace, the world must not allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. He failed to mention that Iran is now stronger than it was when he took office. I'm Jamal Dajani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mosaic. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. 
production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.